thank you. Maybe every day more and more that we belong to an imperishable kingdom. Lord, you lay way to waste man's kingdom, man's ideas, Lord, man's lies, and your justice will reign forever. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are who you say you are and that your plan is not yet finished. You are bringing your church home. We thank you and we worship you. And we just thank you, Lord, that you have saved us. You have drawn us near. You have adopted us as sons and daughters into your kingdom, God. And you will reign forever. And uh, all in Christ is ours because of your great mercy and your great grace and your great plan for us and your whole church as you bring her home, Lord. We just thank you for the gospel and what you exhort to us in, in your word, Lord. We just thank you. You are amazing. You reign forever. You are our king. You are our savior. You are our Lord, God, and it will be so forever, Lord. And we just thank you. We give you praise this morning. I pray that you would open our eyes this morning to your word, to, to your sweetness, Lord. And I pray that our praise would be sweet in return, Lord, as we dive into what you have said. Fill us with your spirit to understand these things, Lord. We need your help. We need each other. And we just thank you once and for all that you are our only king forever, God. We thank you, and everyone said, amen. Let's take some time to greet each other this morning. We get to do some baptisms this morning, so I'm going to give it to Brian. My bad. Here I am. Okay. Celebrating the life of some of our saints going to be home with the Lord and celebrating new life in Christ with some baptisms this morning. Amen. This is a, a physical picture, a symbol that God has given us of the spiritual reality that when you trust in Christ, you're saying his death is my death and his resurrection was my resurrection. And I'm committed now to walk in newness of life, following after him as my Lord and Savior. And that's what baptism symbolizes, the spiritual reality of that inward faith. And so we get the joy this morning of baptizing uh, three saints that um, all of them had um, professed Christ previously in life and um, gone through a baptism, but at a much earlier age and have since realized that they were born again at a later time and realized I need to publicly profess the, the real life that I have in Christ now. That's not just a profession of faith anymore. It's a possession of faith. And so we get the joy of doing that for each of these saints today. This is Mike Brown in the water, and uh, you'll notice his bio is in the bulletin for voting on him as a new member next week, but this is the step before that, right? So, Mike, um, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, and then I get the joy of baptizing you. Do you acknowledge today that you're a sinner deserving of eternal judgment, and that there is no work of 
your own that could earn God's favor. And Mike, do you acknowledge this morning that Jesus Christ is God's only remedy for sin, his death and resurrection, and your only hope of forgiveness and eternal life? And have you trusted in him? Is it your intention today to walk in newness of life and follow Jesus as your Lord and obey him no matter the cost? Hallelujah. Well, then based on your profession of faith this morning, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Next coming on down, we have Selena Estrada. Selena has a similar testimony, but it's been a little bit more recent where some the Lord has supernaturally worked some amazing repentance and new direction of life for her, and she realizes she needs to profess that publicly this morning. So I ask you the same question, Selena. First, do you acknowledge that you're a sinner, deserving of eternal judgment, and that there is no good work of your own that could ever earn God's favor? Do you acknowledge today that Jesus Christ is God's only remedy for sin and your only hope, forgiveness, and eternal life? Have you trusted in him? Is it your intention then today that you want to publicly declare that you're going to obey Christ, follow him as your Lord no matter the cost? Well, then it's my joy, based on the profession of your faith, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And we got one more, a very familiar face. This is Ashley Damari. <laughs> we told her sprinkling doesn't count, girl. <laughs> You'll notice Ashley's bio is also in the bulletin to be voted on as a new member next week. And so, Ashley, I'll ask you the same questions. Do you acknowledge today that you're a sinner? Do you know that you're deserving of his eternal judgment and that there's nothing you could do to earn God's favor by your own works? Do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God's only remedy for sin, his death and resurrection, your only hope? forgiveness and eternal life? And are you trusting in him? And then is your intention today to declare publicly that you want to obey him, follow him as your Lord all the days of your life? Praise the Lord. It's my joy to baptize you in the profession of your faith in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, this morning we commit these souls to you, God. Thank you for the work of salvation in our midst and the newness of life that we can celebrate this morning. And I pray that their testimony now would be an encouragement to the rest of the saints to love the gospel even more and to intensify our worship and our joy in the forgiveness and eternal life we found in Jesus Christ, even now as we sing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Let's stand and worship together.
What blessed mystery, the vilest of all sinners now, forgiven and redeemed. Oh, the depths of darkness, His love would reach down through to cover me with mercy and hide me in His wounds. Oh. Seen today in our eyes. 
heights of your plans for us. True sun changed from the dawn of time that will Father, hear our prayers this morning as we sing that song, one long prayer. We're asking for your glory to be worked out in this earth. You would form us to be like you. You would cause humility in our heart and in in faith in our heart to rise, Lord. We, we need your help, God. We, we come in here looking like the world, believing things that we don't even realize are lies. And then they get exposed and flesh just flares up. Lord, we need your help. We need your help, Lord. We need your truth, and we need your spirit to apply those truths to our lives so that we would be truly changed forever, Lord. So just pray that you would answer those prayers, that you would speak to us, that we would hear you, we would receive you this morning as we open your word to find out what you have said on the things that are at war in our culture right now, Lord. We want to be people who believe the truth, Lord. And so be with us as we see what you have said. And let us courageously stand on these truths, Lord. Change us forever by your spirit and by your truth. We ask that in your name. And everyone said, amen. You may have a seat. Right now we're going to be uh, releasing the Children's for Children's Church. Uh, Brother Kyle is over here on my right. And so if you want to send the children that way, he's ready to receive them. Well, now comes the most pure part of the whole service, right? We're going to be reading from the Word of God, straight from the Word of God, no no interpretation. It's the most pure part of the service, right? Amen? So if you'll turn with me to the book of Romans, we'll be in the first chapter, and we'll be reading verses 18 through 32. And if you're using the Bible that's in the seat behind you or in front of you there, It'll be 1,117. Romans 1. And as everybody's turning there, I would ask that you take a moment and consider leaving all the things of the world outside at the door and condition your heart for the reading of God's word and the preaching of God's word and how it will touch our hearts and affect us. What a tragedy it would be to be here today and not be touched by the Holy Spirit of God through the word. Again, that's Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God 
for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men, likewise, gave up the natural relations with a woman and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Oh my. May God bless the reading of his word today and may Pastor Brian be filled and illuminated with the spirit of God and may it touch our hearts this morning. Amen. Amen. Shane. Let me add to that a prayer of help. Lord, come upon me for proclaiming your word in truth and power and doing what only you can do amongst the hearers here this morning to give them a confidence in the truth and a transformed heart and mind, renewed this morning, sanctified this morning. Give us a firm conviction. Help us withstand whatever comes in this day and age for us. We know your promises are true. You are enough. You are God, and we love you and thank you and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I I want to apologize on the upfront, not for the Word of God by any means, but because I know I have too many notes here already, so we're going to get at it. But, you know, it's not every Sunday that I can tackle the the issue head on in every text we hit, so I want to be thorough. I want to to talk about a lot this morning. So I apologize for that, but thankfully our kids are well taken care of right now, and they are, you know, it's not just glorified babysitting. Okay, you hear me say that, Tiffany? Okay, they are getting God-centered, Christ-exalting theology right now, um, so we can be about it in the service. So we're talking about the social justice movement, and besides race, which we talked about last week, the, the other major emphasis of today's social justice movement has to do with sexuality and gender. So that's where we're going, okay? You got white, male, heterosexual, cisgendered Christians And according to the worldview, they have oppressed women and sexual minorities. And so in the name of social justice, a revolution is underway right now to change that, to unchain women, to unchain the sexual minorities from the bonds of the Judeo-Christian worldview. So we're going to tackle that today, and I'm going to do so unapologetically. Okay? We'll be consistent here. Why it is that some pastors will not even touch these Topics is beyond me and clear evidence that they have no right being in the pulpit. Okay? And those that will touch the topics can't seem to do so without apologizing for God's word and giving a thousand disclaimers. Like, I just want you to know up front that I love homosexuals. I have friends that are homosexual. I, I, you know, I don't think homosexuality is worse than any other sin. And why, why are you doing that? Of course you love them. We're Christian. If you don't love them, you're probably not a Christian, okay? If you hate your brother, there's no love of Christ in you. So why are you doing that, right? Why, why all this apologizing, all these disclaimers? Imagine if, if I did that when we came to the topic of adultery. I just, I just want you guys all to know this morning, I, I love adulterers. 
I have friends that are adulterers. I just, you know, I don't think adultery is really that bad. I just, but, but we got to cover it in the text today. So listen, I want to approach this unapologetically. All the apologizing, all the pandering, all the seeker sensitivity today. Imagine if Jesus was doing that, right? No, he came straight out and said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it off. I praise God for that kind of bold clarity and truth, amen? Like, that's what we need, and so that's what we're after this morning, God's truth to cut right through all the lies and the confusion and the fog so that we know what to believe and how to live a life pleasing to God. That's what we need. And so the big idea, the big idea this morning, expose the root of the sexual revolution, expose the root of the sexual revolution and exalt biblical marriage and gender. There is a lot there I want to cover. You know, this is your typical Valentine's sermon, right? (laughs) We're going to talk about true love, don't worry. We're going to get the negative and the positive. But first, number one for your notes, let's talk about the current state of the culture. We'll talk about the current state of the culture, and then we'll turn to the Word of God. So some of you are old enough to remember when I Love Lucy was first airing in the 1950s on television, right? In the 50s, they thought it was too risque to show a married couple getting in the same bed or even sharing the same blanket on television. And so Lucy and Ricky Ricardo had separate twin beds in the couple's bedroom on their sitcom. Oh, how times have changed. Now I don't know if there is anything in Hollywood or media that is deemed scandalous or risque, right? I mean, most shows being produced are containing soft core porn, Nudity, adultery, homosexuality, um, all, all these perversions, and, and it's, it's not just there, it's celebrated, it's exalted, there's no embarrassment about this, right? As God says in Jeremiah 6.15, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, they did not know how to blush. We are so lost in a reprobate mind in our culture that we no longer know how to blush and feel shame over that which is shameful. It is shameful. We are proud. We're the exact opposite. We will devote an entire month to gay pride, right? And all of corporate America will bow down to the LGBT movement and put the flag, the rainbow, I'm sorry, the rainbow on everything they can and forget that the rainbow was the very symbol that God gave his people after he flooded the entire world in terrifying swift judgment for people committing the exact same sins that we're now using to exalt the rainbow with. Paul said, Ephesians 5.12, it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. And it's not in secret, but this is why this is not fun this morning. It is not enjoyable to speak about such shameful things, right? But Paul also says, the verse right before that, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And so that's what we're going to do. We need to expose the wickedness of the world's sexual ethic, the religious root of this perversion, and exalt the biblical teaching of marriage and sexuality. The social justice movement wants you to think that this is about justice and equality, when, when it's actually about revolution. It is about completely dismantling society and leveling all authority. And and if you consider the words from the Gay Liberation Manifesto of 1971, it says right there, printed in 1971, equality is never going to be enough. What is needed is a total social revolution, a complete reordering of civilization, including society's most basic institution, the patriarchal society. So we are in the midst of a revolution, seeking to bring upheaval to all society. And for a long time, we in the West, in America, have, have had a reprieve because of the prevailing influence of the Christian worldview and, and the biblical morality and ethics, right? But that has come to a bitter end. It's come to a bitter end. The two greatest assaults on American society that have been perpetrated today have not been per- perpetrated by foreign terrorists. They've been perpetrated by our own people. And no, I'm not talking about the insurrection on January 6th, okay? This is far worse than that. We're talking about 
The two greatest assaults on our nation have come from our own government. The first was when the Supreme Court ruled it was constitutional to kill your babies 2000, or 48 years ago. And the second is when the Supreme Court ruled to legalize homosexual marriage in all 50 states in 2015. Marriage equality, the left calls it. And so, first, destroy life in the womb, destroy motherhood, and then destroy marriage itself. Now, I want to put some of these pieces together for you so you understand what's happening in your world and the revolution that's taking place. Because there is a goal, there is an agenda in this, and it's not really marriage equality, it's the total abolition of marriage itself. That's what's coming. God designed marriage to be this private, sovereign unit to protect against corruption. It has its own authority and the headship of the Father. And, and if you can obliterate the family unit, you can destroy society. Now there's no marriage. People are just making whatever contracts and agreements they want with whoever they want, whenever they want. And now your children are no longer your children. They belong to who? To the state. Right? They belong to the education system. They belong to the state, but not to you because there's no such thing as a family anymore. And so here in Oregon, at 15 years old, you can go and get a sex change operation without telling your parents, and the state will do it and pay for it. Destroy the family, and the state owns your children. In Ohio, a judge removed a child from her parents' custody because they would not start her on hormone treatments to so-called transition to be, try to become a man. They, the judge removed her from her own parents. No family, and the state controls everything. So this goes all the way back to the beginning of the feminist movement with the uh, development of contraception. Now you can have sex without having children. And this so-called liberation of contraception was like setting a match to the fire of the sexual revolution because now, for the first time, the greatest natural restraint against promiscuity and immorality, that, that natural restraint of potentially having children with this person, that is removed. But that's not enough, right? And so then you, then you bring in abortion because just in case you still get pregnant, now you can terminate your pregnancy, which is a euphemism for murder your baby. And I know we talk a lot about abortion here because it is the greatest evil and injustice in our world happening on our watch. But I, I need you to understand how this all comes together, okay? If, if abortion is the 10% the of the iceberg that you see above the surface of the water, what we're talking about this morning, the 90% of that iceberg that's underneath the water, under the surface, is the rampant sexual immorality and sexual anarchy that's going on in our culture. Now you can have sex without children, and now, get, get this, you can have children without sex. You can manufacture a baby. Lesbians can have a baby by, by implanting a living being from someone else into their womb. And so the normal reason for marriage, a man and a woman coming together to produce children, that's not necessary anymore. Why do you need a family? Why, why, do you need a, why do you need a husband? Why do you need a wife? Why not just have a dog instead? It's easier, right? Why have children? Why get married? Too many complications, too many questions. It's too binding. Why get married? This revolution is in full swing, and its end is the destruction of society because they're seeking to destroy every good thing that God has created and ordained for the flourishing of human society. And so... There are natural consequences for that, and of course there are also divine consequences for that that we see laid out in Scripture that we're going to get into. LGBT, that is now the abbreviated term for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, LGBT plus, because the plus then goes on to include pansexual, queer, gender queer, intersex, agender, asexual, and more. And no, I don't know what all those things are because I'm telling you, I can't engross that many hours in a week to this stuff, right? They're just going to keep coming up with more. You understand? That's why it's plus, 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 because once you've ditched all objective standards for morality, it is a constantly changing, constantly evolving standard based on 
whatever man wants in his perverted desires that he comes up with. Which Christians took a lot of flack in the last decade around the same-sex marriage debate. Because part of what was being argued from the, from the conservative or the Christian base was that you legalize hom uh, homosexual marriage, so-called marriage, and that's just going to lead the way to what? To polygamy and bestiality and incest and pedophilia and man marrying his dog and everything else, right? And I'm telling you, I was talking to a guy at the gay pride parade here in Roseburg, and they get, people get really upset when they think you're comparing them to bestiality and pedophilia, which of course we're not, and they're not the same thing. But the point that you're making is that once you remove God and his word as the standard for society and truth and morality, you, you make man his own God. You make man his own source of truth and his own source of morality. And so where does the snowball of downward immorality stop? And who's to stop it? You say sodomy is right and good for you. Well, this person says incest is right and good for them. Who's to tell them they're wrong? Love is love, they say. Their entire worldview, make yourself as happy as possible. Do whatever you want and what feels good. You can't stop that snowball. You can't stop that downward spiral in immorality. And it's exactly what we're seeing happening today. It turns out Christians were right. And pedophilia has actually been rebranded as MAP, M-A-P, Minor Attracted Persons. And there's a movement to be included in one of the plus plus pluses of LGBT because it makes sense. Think about it. They're just another sexual minority that needs to be liberated because they've been oppressed by the social constructs we've created under the Judeo-Christian worldview. It makes sense. That primary rationale of their motto, love is love. Who, who's to say then that the school teacher who loves prepubescent boys is wrong? Love is love. No doubt we will see polygamy and pedophilia and other perversions become the new human rights issue of our day in a few years. Just consider this headline from LifeSite News, December 17th, 2018. 11-year-old drag kid dances in popular New York City gay club as patrons toss money at him. According to our president, right now the human rights issue of our day is what? You know? Transgenderism. Transgenderism. The idea that your gender identity does not match your biological sex that you were born with, and so you transition to the other sex with hormone treatments and surgeries, absolutely mutilating your God-given body so that you can be your true self. President Biden said in January 2020, transgender equality is the civil rights issue of our time, meaning this is, gonna, th this is being raised to the same level as racism, right? To discriminate against someone based on the color of their skin, we all condemn that, right? Now you can't discriminate and say it's wrong for a man to think he's a woman and mutilate his own body. It's the same thing. So this is the absolute insanity of our culture. Someone says, what, I, I, I identify now as a no-armed mermaid. Like, I just, I knew something was wrong ever since my youth, and, and I didn't feel right with who I was, and I realized I was actually, I, I'm really a no-armed mermaid, but God made a mistake and made me a two-armed woman. And so what are, we, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to uh, uh, affirm this delusion? Help them pay to actually have their arms surgically removed and stitch up their lower half like a mermaid? Listen, that is not loving someone. That person needs help. That person needs repentance. That person probably needs mental health care. Okay? And for the rest of society to be forced by the government to to accept the delusion, to enter into the lie with them, to go along with it is absolutely wicked and totalitarian. And that is exactly what the Equality Act that Biden and Harris have 
promise they're going to sign into law is going to do. Okay, The Equality Act will add sexual orientation, transgender, all the LGBT things to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and basically open up Bible-believing churches and schools and hospitals and businesses and, and ministries to relentless lawsuits and criminal charges because we're not going to stop preaching the truth, <laughs> right? And, and, and so if we deny membership or admission to or leadership in to a so-called transgender or to a homosexual, you are now going to be at odds with the law in the United States of America, showing discrimination. And so we need, I, I want you church to understand right now where we as elders are at, we will not bow to Caesar. You hear me? We bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's the head of the church. We're going to say what he wants us to do. They can throw us in the lion's den, but we're not going to bow. And I want you to get this, church. The church of Jesus Christ was never promised liberty or freedom. The church was promised persecution. Okay? But God is enough for us. We're not going to bow. You'll recall President Biden said in the midst of his campaign that one time he came out of his basement that a woman's, a woman's eight-year-old so-called transgender daughter he said she ought to have full rights to transition and live as a transgender without any discrimination. That is child abuse. There's no way around that. That is child abuse. These children can't pick their own bedtime or their own diet, but we're going to let them choose what gender they want to be and start them on permanently mutilating their bodies with these gender transition treatments and hormones. That's child abuse. We have parents today that are raising they bees. Not babies, they bees. These are children that from birth they are not de designated a gender. And so they're using gender neutral pronouns until the children can decide their own gender. The transgender craze among teens is astounding right now. Okay? The, the, the number that are being referred medically to gender treatment has increased 1,000% in the U.S. and 3,000% in the U.K. And before, it was ridiculously rare, 0.01% of the population. And now you got tens of thousands of these teens that are coming out. Because while, although they never felt, experienced any discomfort in their biological sex previously, now they've heard this coming out story from a speaker at their public school or they discovered some YouTube influencer or some celebrity or some gender affirming therapist and suddenly parents are finding their precious children caught up in this delusion and demanding a double mastectomy and puberty blockers that are going to cause permanent infertility to these young women. It's wicked. You want to talk about the globalist agenda to control the population of the planet, what better way than to tell little girls to destroy their God-given gift of bearing children by becoming transgender because it's so cool right now. There's a wicked agenda at play. And we are being forced to live in this lie, and you see it immediately day one of Biden's presidency signing executive orders that have killed women's sports. Right now, our daughters are supposed to play with and race with a six foot two biological male that's got 75 pounds on her. Right? And this is what's crazy is that it's such a reprobate mind in society that we don't see a problem with that. Right? I mean, would you have, a few years ago, you probably wouldn't have dreamt of society exalting and honoring as courageous a six foot two biological male for beating up on little girls out on the sports field. Now it's courageous and it's, and it's honorable. Isaiah 5.20 Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. You hear that? That's God's curse on those who reverse morality. 
That's a damnation on those who reverse morality. And that is what we've done. Our nation has taken a stand against God, is legislating sin and criminalizing righteousness. How do we know what is good and evil? We know because of the Word of God, the only source and standard of truth. And I want to consider the clear testimony of Scripture about some of these things this morning. First, Genesis 18 and 19. We're not going to turn there. But all the way back at the beginning, we see the same sins plaguing humanity. The men of Sodom tried to rape angels. Angels who had taken male human form and had come to visit. It says every man in that town came out. Now, towns were not as big as they are today, but we're still probably talking about 100 men wanting to gang rape these two visitors. And so they are so driven by insatiable lust in the passage. It says that even after the angels blinded them in a judgment of God, they spent all night blindly groping for the door to get a hold of these two men for sex. What was the result of that? God rained fire from heaven, destroying the entire cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. What's the lesson that we learn today? Listen to the testimony of the New Testament, Jude 7. I have that on the screen. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. What do we learn of that? That it deserves eternal punishment of fire. Then there's Leviticus 18.22. And listen, if you're one here this morning that you struggle with, are these the right interpretations of the passages? You've heard somebody on YouTube tell you that, that we've misrepresented and homosexuality isn't really a sin and all that. I'll talk to you later. You can come afterward. I will show you why those are smoke screens and terrible interpretations, okay? But follow with me this morning. Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. How does God feel about it? Oh, God, you need to be more seeker sensitive. No, it's black and white. It is an abomination. And what exactly are we talking about? We're talking about homosexuality. Is it clear? Absolutely. How does a man lie with a woman? What's the natural reading of the text? Well, that, we're talking intercourse, right? You shall not lie with a male as a man lies with a female. You shouldn't do that. Leviticus 20.13 repeats the same command, but adds, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon them. So what's the just penalty for homosexuality under the theocracy of Israel? Death. That's what God says. Now jumping in the New Testament, I'll come back to Romans 1 in a minute, but 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, Paul says that the law is laid down for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Now, some will object that the word here for homosexual, it didn't exist before, and the translators translated it that way to push their homophobic agenda, and that what Paul really was talking about has to do more with pedophilia, men lying with young boys. Here's why that's ridiculous. Of course, the word homosexual didn't exist. Okay? It, it is a, just like all language, words change over time, and that word was created to describe a certain behavior. The question is, does it describe the behavior that Paul was talking about in the Greek when he originally wrote it in the Greek? The Greek word is arsenikoitai. That means arseno, male, a male, and koitai meaning a mat or a bed, literally a male-only bed. And Paul is getting that. Where is he getting this word from? These, you know, arsenikoita, it's coming from what's called the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So he's going back to Leviticus 18 and 20 that we just looked at, and the Greek translation of that uses that same compound of the word, arsenikoita, and he's pulling it over into the New Testament. And so back in Leviticus 18 and 20, was the context clear? Don't lie with a male as with a woman, Right? So clearly what Paul's talking about here is condemning all homosexual activity. That's what arsenikoitai refers to. Homosexual being, in our culture, a proper translation. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 says very clearly, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. See, God doesn't want us to live in confusion in the fog. He says, do not be deceived about this. Don't be confused about this, Christian. No, Paul is saying that those who practice these things are not saved. Don't be deceived. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. They're not saved. You don't need to be deceived about that. The, the gay Christian and the transgender Christian, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Not that they can't be saved, as we'll see in a minute, but those who practice, actively practice unrepentant sin, whether it's idolatry or adultery or homosexuality or lying, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Interesting nuance in the Greek, some of your translations might add effeminate and homosexual, men who practice homosexuality. And that is because there are two different Greek words there in the original, the arsenikoitai that we talked about, homosexual, and another word, malakos, meaning soft or effeminate. And the ESV that I'm reading, the translators choose to translate it just as one thing, homosexual. And they're probably right in doing so because what scholars believe Paul is referring to with these two words is he's referring to the active and the passive participants in the homosexual act. The homosexual is the sodomizer. The effeminate is the one sodomized. Both sides of the behavior. That's in your Bible. But let's look at verse 11 together. Pull that on the screen. This is the next verse. Paul says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. There is forgiveness and salvation and transformation available in Jesus Christ. There were people sitting in the Corinthian church, in the congregation like this, who were previously homosexual, adulterers, temple prostitutes, drunkards, and on and on, but they found salvation through the only Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for sins and was raised for our justification. There's only one hope for any sinner, whether it's heterosexual immorality or homosexual immorality or gender dysphoria or any other rebellion against God, and that hope is found only in the gospel of Jesus Christ because Christ can save to the uttermost. And notice this, when he saves, he sanctifies and changes you. He says, such were some of you, past tense. No longer. You found repentance. You're a change. Why it is that there are so-called same-sex attracted Christians calling themselves gay Christian. Gay Christian who, well, I'm going to live celibate, but I'm a gay Christian. Gay is no longer your identity. You've been washed. Such were some of you, but no more. If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. So let me make something really clear this morning. According to the scripture, homosexuality is a sin. It is a sin. And so what do they need? They need a savior. They need salvation. In the words of John MacArthur, they don't need healing. Homosexuality is not a disease. They don't need therapy. It's not a psychological condition. They need forgiveness because homosexuality is a sin. Which means that there's actually hope. Because Christ died for who? For sinners. They need forgiveness. And so does anyone else in the LGBT community. And there is only one answer for sin, and that's the gospel. Must turn to Christ, and he will save you. Which brings me to only my second point, the religious root of sexual perversion. The religious root of sexual, sexual perversion, because we need to understand this morning that this sexual perversion we're seeing in the culture today is not the root, it is the fruit of something else, namely a rejection of God in exchange for the worship of the creature. 
So I want you to go back to Romans 1 with me because we need to understand we don't have first a behavior problem. We have first a worship problem. There at verse 1, we'll bounce around a little bit. I'm sorry, Romans 1 verse 21. He says at the end of verse 20, they are without excuse, verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So let's start there. Everyone knows God. He's revealed himself in creation, the law written on the hearts. Everyone knows God. Notice also Paul didn't say that that they know there is a God. Okay? They know God. God, Yahweh himself, has impressed upon every soul the knowledge of God so that they were without excuse and they have rejected that, the true God, and suppressed that truth in unrighteousness, verse 18. But it's more than that. Man is not content to stop at his atheism or his agnosticism because we are worshipers by nature. Our hearts are idol factories and we will worship something or someone if not Yahweh. So look at verse 23. Verse 23, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Down at verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So it's not whether we will worship God, it's which God are we going to worship? There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. There's no innocent people out there that just need, you know, to the information of the gospel and they immediately get saved without repentance. No, there's, everyone's guilty. Everyone's without excuse. Our society has rejected God and instead bowed to the religion of secular humanism, which I've described before as man being his own God, man determining truth and being his own source and standard of morality. You know, just be whoever you want to be. Right? Just follow your heart. Believe in yourself. What happens when you tell generations of children, just be whatever you want to be when you grow up? You get a society that is legislating sin, signing iniquitous decrees and laws. Like it says there in verse 32 of the text, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So society disapproves of God's standard. God says these sins deserve death. We're going to get rid of that standard. And instead, we're going to give approval to people doing evil because we're going to set up our own standard and call evil good and good evil and legislate it to reward the evil and punish the good, the exact opposite of why God ordained human government in the first place. So what is the result of this kind of rebellion against God? Look at verse 24. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts. Verse 26, Therefore, or for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. Three times, God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them up. What happens when when you reject the creator and worship the creation? God gives them over to their own sinful desires. That is an act of God's judgment on a people, on a society. His wrath revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. This is what theologians call his wrath of abandonment. Right? God's got wrath that comes in sometimes direct, immediate swift judgment, right? He's got eschatological wrath that we're going to see in the seven-year tribulation period at the end times, right? But there's also what's called the wrath of abandonment. And this is where God, like in Romans 1, is pulling back his restraining grace. And he's giving men over to their lusts so that we in that kind of snowball effect become as evil as our wicked hearts desire. And what is it that we see happens when a society has been given over? What are the signs that the society has been given over? And I just want you to follow the argument of Romans 1 with me and ask yourself this question, is America experiencing this wrath of abandonment, this judgment of God, or not? Look at verse 24 again. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So the first thing you see when God gives up a society, is a sexual revolution. A sexual revolution. We saw that in the 60s and 70s. 
with the development of contraception and everything else. Now, today we have a $12 billion porn industry. Over 50% of children being born in America today are being born to parents that are not married, which means fornication, cohabitating, adultery, divorce are all commonplace. First you have a sexual revolution, then verse 26, 27, you have a homosexual revolution. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. I want you to notice a few things in the text as you look at it. First, notice Paul mentions lesbianism explicitly here. This isn't just men. Lesbianism is condemned here in Scripture. Notice also that Paul calls this behavior against nature. Against nature. Don't tell me you were born this way. Nature itself testifies to heterosexual relations. It says here that this is contrary to nature. Homosex is contrary to nature. Nature itself testifies to heterosexual relations. And so homosex is not just, it's not just immoral. It is a perversion of the created order. It goes against nature itself and is a sin issue. You notice also here Paul calls these dishonorable passions. Dishonorable passions meaning, yes, same-sex attraction itself is a sin issue. It's 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 a disordered passion in the heart. You got people today trying to claim that, you know, you can be same-sex attracted, that's not sinful, just don't act on it, right? The, the act itself is, is what the Bible condemns, wrong. These passions and desires God calls dishonorable. Evil starts in the heart with what we lust after. Homosexual desire is wrong. It's against nature. Note also this, that he's not just talking about older men with younger boys as they will claim, right? He says, verse 27, men likewise were consumed with passion for one another. What's that? That's mutual, consensual. And so, when a society is under the wrath of God, is experiencing this judgment of God, it looks like God giving them up in the lust of their hearts to a sexual revolution that takes place, which then escalates into a homosexual revolution. And lastly, verse 28, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. In other words, the mind is so deceived and so lost, it's completely enslaved to justifying whatever wicked desires of our hearts there are. Good is evil. Evil is good. Suddenly, you don't know if a boy is a boy or if a girl is a girl. Or if a baby is really a baby. Or if a lie is really a lie. Just absolute chaos. Because of a debased mind in society, a loss of all common sense, basic reason and virtue. Is Paul describing America? Yes, absolutely. This has been underway for a while. Don't let anyone tell you also that homosexuality is exactly the same as every other sin. Or like J.D. Greer, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention said, the Bible only whispers about homosexuality. It shouts about other sins. That is not true. Because if you're paying attention to Romans 1, it's given here by Paul as an illustration of just how low a society can go in its rebellion against God. It's it's used as a red flag warning. We're really off course now. All sin needs to be forgiven. All sin can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. But the homosexual revolution is evidence of a debased mind and something that is contrary to nature. And understand, this kind of behavior that we're seeing celebrated in our culture today, it's not what brings the judgment of God. It does. It is the judgment of God on a society. 
God giving us over to a debased mind and to do what ought not to be done. Why? Because we've worshipped and exalted the creature over the Creator. That is the root, the religious root of the sexual revolution we see today. And so that brings me to thirdly here, I need to spend some time to talk quickly about the beauty of God's created order. The beauty of God's created order. It's one thing to know what the Bible condemns as sinful and as an abomination. We need to know that and and, and we need to know what God hates. But it's only half the truth because the Bible teaches us the positive side of how he created mankind, male and female, and he created the beauty of marriage and sexual pleasure and procreation. And we need to understand this morning, God is... Okay, God is so abundantly gracious and filled with joy and creative. And he's so full of goodness, far from being prudish, right? He designed our bodies to work the way they do and to enjoy the pleasure that they do in the marriage relationship. God did that. God's not embarrassed about that. That's God's gift to mankind for his glory and our enjoyment. Consider Genesis 127. On the sixth day of creation, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So how many genders did God make at the beginning? Two. And only two. Male and female. Now, did God make a mistake? Is it important then to the glory of God being made in his image as male and female, is it important then that males be masculine and females be feminine? Yeah, because God didn't make a mistake and we're not the same. We are unique and distinct as male and female, right? Males and females are not the same and we are to seek, we're not to seek to to try to blur the lines, uh, the distinctions between male and female, okay? God explicitly condemns cross-dressing Transvestism in Deuteronomy 22.5. He calls it an abomination, just like he does homosexuality. It matters that women be women and men be men. Which means women should only wear dresses to church and not pants. Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? No, no, because the guys that were writing this weren't wearing pants either. What were they wearing? (laughs) Dresses, right? They were wearing robes. (laughs) No, but the point is this. Women should glory in their womanhood. Should glory in their womanhood. And contrary to the feminist movement that ultimately says, women, you're only truly fulfilled when you're doing everything that a man can do. Essentially trying to be a man. No, no, you're fulfilled when you're being woman, right? Women, you cannot be men. Men, you cannot be women. Okay? Let's just be really clear this morning, okay? And God didn't make a mistake when he chose your gender. When? Before the foundations of the world, okay? He knew what he was doing when he made you, and you are only going to be fulfilled in life when you're fulfilling your God-given mandate as male or female. And God created marriage for one man, one woman to come together in a one flesh sexual union to create the family and conceive of children. We see that in Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That is God's design for marriage. And this was instituted from the very beginning of creation. One man, one woman, leaving parents, becoming their own sovereign unit and family, cleaving to one another, enjoying one another sexually, and multiplying through that enjoyment to fill the earth. That is foundational to society and to human flourishing, and it's exactly what Satan is out to destroy. The family, marriage itself. Jesus affirms the beauty of God's created order in Matthew 19. We looked at it just a few weeks ago. You pull up Matthew 19. And the Pharisees came to him, tested him, asking, is it lawful to divorce a wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read? Where's he going to go? Genesis. He who created him from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become 
one flesh, so they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Listen to me when you hear someone tell you, but Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. That's a big argument they use today. First of all, start with, uh, you know Jesus is God, right? He's, he's the God of the entire Bible. All of it, Leviticus too, right? Secondly, what's Jesus teaching right here? He's teaching the beauty of God's created order that it's male and female in monogamous covenant relationship till death. That's what marriage is. And he goes out of his way to quote Genesis and remind everyone, God only created two sexes, male and female, instituted marriage to be a monogamous covenant unto death, and what God has joined together, let not man separate. And this is the only thing that God sees as marriage. Okay? The only thing, right? You can talk about so-called same-sex marriage all you want. It's not marriage. It just, it doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Marriage is not a social construct that we can just change with the times. It was instituted and ordained by God himself from the beginning. He defines what it is. And it is beautiful. It is essential to human flourishing. Consider lastly here the roles that he gave in this beautiful created order. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. God instituted roles for men and women that are unique. God gave man the authority and responsibility to be the head of his wife, even as Christ is to the church. And women, he designed you beautifully, rightly, to be the helpmate for the man. To joyfully come under the safety of his loving authority and headship to submit and follow and help man in his God-given purpose. He designed you to bear children and to nurture them and to care for the home, Titus 2, 4, and 5. So let me give you some brief exhortations that you're not going to hear on mainstream media today. Men, fulfill your calling. Love your wife, men. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Take the responsibility to lead. Be the pastor of your flock in the home. Take responsibility to lead, to protect, to provide spiritually and physically. And men, if you need to repent this morning of any domineering, abusive, totalitarian, authoritarian kind of headship, you repent before Jesus Christ today. And if you need to repent, more likely for some of us, of lazy, passive, forsaking of our duty as men, you repent this morning and find forgiveness in Jesus, and you lead your home. And women, women, fulfill your calling, women. Respect your husband. Submit to him as unto the Lord, and have babies. (laughs) Have babies, and care for your home. Care for your home. Don't Don't despise the high and holy calling of womanhood and motherhood and being a wife. Don't despise it and think that instead I'm going to be more fulfilled by trying to climb the corporate ladder or make lots of money or pursue some dream outside of the home. You need to understand, women, only you can do what God called you to do. Husbands need their wives to be wives. (laughs) And their children need their moms to be moms because no one else can do what you do, women. Love your children. Teach them. Instruct them. Care for them. Don't forsake your highest calling for some lesser pursuit. Trust that God knows what he's doing when he made us male and female and gave us those complementary roles because it's only then that this beautiful dance starts to take place and we find our great joy and human flourishing. Which brings me to my conclusion here. Number four, the true love of the gospel. It is Valentine's Day and all. So I just want to close briefly on the amazing love of God in the gospel. Because social justice warriors will say love is love is love. And they have so redefined love in our narcissistic culture to be 
you know, do whatever makes you happy and, and, you know, it's unconditional positive affirmation and applauding people in every decision and making much of them no matter what, right? And so you are unloving to deny homosexuals the freedom to marry and do what makes them happy. And they project that definition on God himself. God's love just means he's infinitely tolerant of sin. And we saw through the holiness of God series that is absolutely false. What is true love? The world knows nothing of true love because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the standard and source of love. Here's your closing verse. 1 John 4, verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. True love doesn't start with us. It starts with God. He's the source. He initiates He loves first. We love because he first loved us. And this love is not in response to anything good or bad about us. It is an unconditional, free, gracious, agape love. It's not based on you being lovable or worthy. In fact, we know ourselves to be sinners. Understand this love is a selfless, self-sacrificing love. He gave. He, He didn't take. He gave his son. Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins and remember the supremacy of this love this morning, saints. That this love for you is from eternity past, choosing you to be holy and in love He predestined you for adoption through Jesus Christ. God did not save you and therefore He loves you. He loves you and therefore He saved you. And so how are we to love those that are in the LGBT community and at enmity with God? Condemned. What does compassion look like? It is not empowering them to do whatever makes them happy. That is hate. Because it will only lead to their eternal damnation. We will enslave them and teach them not to blush when they ought to blush. True love does what? True love warns of of coming eternal damnation. True love warns. That's what Jesus did. That's what the Old Testament prophets did. That's what the apostles did. True love warns those who are headed to hell, warns urgently and passionately to turn and be saved, to flee the wrath to come, to find safety, forgiveness in the cleft of the rock who is Jesus Christ, that they don't have to perish in hell. That is what true love does. It's not about condemning them. The Bible says they are condemned already in their sin. It is about bringing a conviction of sin so that they repent and embrace the only hope of salvation for all sinners, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord this morning, Jesus is perfect in his love, and the cross is sufficient to forgive every sin, no matter who you are or what you've done, if you humble yourself and call upon his name. Turn to Christ this morning, humble yourself, come to him, find life in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, draw sinners to yourself now in this moment as we respond in prayer and song. Your presence is here working through your truth. I pray that you would minister to our hearts the clarity of your word. Our minds would be fixed in these issues. Now, looking at the scriptures, our consciences would be bound now to what we just read in scripture as the truth. And that we would no longer be deceived by all the lies in the culture and all the ways in which we're being desensitized to the sin, to the rampant immorality, not knowing how to blush anymore. Oh God, would you resensitize your people to the sin and to the evil that we wouldn't want to touch it, have any hint of it, that we would want to be separate from the world for the sake of the world to save them. Make us holy, God, to give us courage and compassion with the truth as we seek to love our neighbor as ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Let's stand and respond in a song of worship.
the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall. There is still one King reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth. Just a reminder, church, if you would like to give, we have boxes here in the sanctuary, one out in the foyer. You can also give online at notes.wbf.church, also in our app. And let's all say this as a church together before we go out today. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God be with you this week, church. Thank you.